Welcome to Money, Me and COVID-19, where we talk with opinion leaders to get their take on the financial, business and social impact of the coronavirus. And in today's episode, the tables are very much turned and our special guest is the man who usually sits in the chair. That's uh, speaker, author, TV presenter and investor, Graham Rowan. Graham, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Robert, I, uh, I think. <laughs> Okay, well, first, uh, let's start with what, what's your overall take on the COVID-19 situation and how governments are responding to it? Well, to be honest, Robert, I, I'm kind of concerned on, on several levels because to me, what I'm seeing is a, a, a one-dimensional response to a three-dimensional issue. Let me explain what I mean by that. If you uh, imagine a triangle, to me, there are, there are three things that have to be taken into account here. One is obviously the health impact of the pandemic. Another is the economic impact of whatever measures are taken. And the third part of that triangle that no one is talking about at all is the impact on our, our personal kind of freedoms and liberties as citizens of all these measures that are being enacted. And, and you know, politics is all about trade-offs and making difficult choices. So, if you imagine a completely balanced response to this, it might be sort of 33% feel the health issue, 33% the economic impact, and 33% the impact on our freedoms. What we're actually seeing is the government essentially saying we're going 100% after the health implications of this, and to hell with the economy and to hell with the freedom of our citizens. And uh, that may or may not prove ultimately to have been the best approach to this, but I think it's important to, to point out that there have been other approaches. If you look at South Korea, for example, they've managed to address the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in a country not dissimilar to us, about 52 million population, without having a lockdown. And the reason they've done that is that they were better prepared, they implemented the testing much quicker, they brought together all aspects of both national and local government and all aspects of their health system to provide a coordinated response. And whilst our government wasted five or six weeks back in January, February doing absolutely nothing, they were getting on top of this. So it remains to be seen, you know, what's gonna come out of this, but um, some of the measures that have been implemented, I mean, you know, we're all kind of in, in, in lockdown now and, you know, in the house arrest, but it's even worse in other countries. I, I have a friend in Tenerife who, if he just steps outside the door, he's going to get fined by the police. I've got friends in France who've got to, you know, the, the French love their bureaucracy, of course, so they've got to fill in their paperwork before they're allowed to go out. And I think they just banned the use of pedal bikes in France. You know, bizarre. And even here, our police have had to be told to back off a bit after they were kind of a bit overzealous in applying their new uh, uh, measures. So. Um, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about the impact of those measures, and I know they're supposed to be temporary, but as Tim Price said on this program recently, you know, there's nothing lasts longer than emergency government measures. And a good example of that would be the, the Patriot Act in America. It was introduced in the aftermath of 9-11, giving massive new powers to government and quasi-government organizations. It's still on the statute book 20 years later. So, um, you know, uh, my, my fear is that the, the lasting gift that China will have given the West is not so much coronavirus, it's the kind of totalitarian government that they specialize in. I'll be very interested to see if this act actually gets repealed later on in the year. Okay. Um, are there any statistics that you feel can give us an early indication of the economic impact of COVID-19? Oh, yeah, they're, they're, they're starting to feed through the system. There'll be more coming out this week. But uh, let me give you a few examples. Uh, China has just announced its first quarter results. And it's basically seen an end to 40 years of sustained growth. So they had a 7% contraction of GDP in the first quarter. Um, the IMF is saying the economic outlook is the worst since the Great Depression in the 1930s. Even the Bank of England, which is normally quite upbeat, is predicting a 35% drop in our economy this year with what they're calling you know, deep scars coming out of that. 
um, Andrew Bailey, the governor, is, is talking about expanding these business interruption loans from 80 to 100 percent. He says, you know, we'll also need uh, just grants. We just need to give money to these businesses or they're going to fail. Um, and, and he also d does not expect this V-shaped recovery that people are talking about. So, so he, he's quite concerned. Um, I think, you know, the, the uh, capital economics are talking about a 20% decline in the economy just this month. And we're talking about unemployment going up from 3.9% to 10% more than two million jobs being at risk. Um, if you look at landlords, you know, who are old landlords? They had a five-year vendetta of government measures, including Section 24 and everything else. Now they've got tenants who can't afford to pay. So in the month of uh, March, on average, only 44% of rent got paid on time. So imagine the cash flow impact of that on, on a landlord. So, you know, another month of lockdown is not exactly going to help that. So I imagine quite a few landlords are going to want to sell up, uh, you know, once we get out the other side of this. So, I mean, that, that's, 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 that's the UK. What about um, in America? Oh, America. I mean, it's just been complete uh, uh, devastation. They, they, they have lost 25 million jobs in about four weeks. And the first signs of protest began at the weekend. There was a, uh, uh, because of social distancing, we couldn't have a march, but they all got into their Ford F-150 pickup trucks and wrote big, you know, reopen uh, the economy kind of uh, banners on the cars and drove around protesting. So, so America's economy, e economy has been taking a huge hit. The Fed obviously has been throwing money at this. Its balance sheet has gone from four trillion to six trillion in about three weeks and they've now started buying not just bonds they're buying etfs exchange traded funds so they're they're coming into the stock market and that's causing market manipulation on an unprecedented scale so it becomes really hard for us as investors to to know what the fair price of anything is when government agencies are buying up not just bonds now, they're buying up ETFs and funds and probably soon individual stocks and shares as well. Well, yes, um, you can understand why. Uh, the stock markets have fallen uh, around about 30%, and now they've started showing some signs of recovery. Do you think that the worst is over? Uh, sadly, I don't. I, I, I think a lot of people are kind of predicting that and, and the stock markets, you know, do look like they've recovered quite a bit of ground and I can see why people might feel that. But I think people are ignoring what I call the, the domino effect, which is that something happens in one part of the world, which then has an implication for something else that doesn't immediately appear, um, perhaps might appear three or four months later. So let me give you some examples. I just told you about China announcing its really bad results. That's going to have a huge knock-on effect to the Australian economy, where something like 40% of their GDP is exports to Australia. So one of the things I would expect to see now is a, a property price crash in Australia, where property has been in a bubble for some time. Um, this is now going to be that kind of black swan event that, that suddenly hits their economy really hard. Another example I'd give you would be um, retailers. We know that retailers were already struggling on the high street before this happened. Uh, one of the companies that owns a lot of shopping malls in the UK is called Into. Now, just three years ago, they were in the FTSE 100, one of the most valuable companies in the country. But a combination of having loaded themselves up with debt and now not getting rent paid by their struggling retail clients has made that company a penny stock that's about to go out of business. Closer to home, I've been working for 15 months with a New Zealand fund on a multi-million pound investment. It was meant to close in March, and suddenly we got told, well, because funds we were expecting to get from other projects have now disappeared, we are gonna to have to divert these funds from you to those other projects. So, so my deal has effectively gone away uh, as a domino effect from that. So when you start looking at the impact of those sorts of things, you know, there's tens of thousands of transactions like that happening across the globe, and they take time to work through the system. So I fear what we'll get 
you know, you, we might look back on this as what some people call a sucker's rally. You know, it, it goes down, then it goes up before going down again. Um, there's certainly a lot of uh, pent up implications of all this that are not yet visible in the numbers. We'll learn more later this week when uh, some of our own numbers in the UK come out. But it's hard to avoid seeing this as being way worse than 2008. It's deeper, it's broader, and it's going to take a lot longer to recover from. Okay. Um, well, what about the, the impact of, of lockdown and, and furloughing on households? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, they're, they're already people have been offered a three-month mortgage holiday. They're now being offered a holiday on their payday loans and their car loans. What I think people don't realize is that the interest still keeps accruing during a holiday. And what you effectively have is more to pay later. Now, these people can't pay today. Another month in lockdown, what I said earlier on about coming out of furlough, you know, are these people going to be in a stronger position in a month's time or two months' time? I, I don't think so. You know, I think they're going to, they're not going to have the cash to repay these loans. So, you know, what's that going to mean in terms of repossessions of houses and cars as people, you know, simply cannot make those payments in the years ahead. So uh, I think that's going to be a real issue. And I do believe, and, you know, sadly, I don't, you know, sorry to sound like a bearer of bad news, but I do think a lot of these people who've been furloughed and perhaps are still enjoying what they see as a bit of a holiday at the moment, are not going to have jobs to go back to. It's very revealing that this week in which we're, we're recording this, um, the government has just extended that furlough scheme to the end of June. The reason they did that was that companies were coming to them and saying, look, if you don't give us that commitment today, we are going to start issuing redundancy notices tomorrow because we have a 45-day consultation process to go through. And that's going to run out before the, uh, by the time the furlough runs out. So a lot of companies, I think, are ready to lay people off as soon as the government funding dries up. So, you know, that's where I think we'll see the next wave of impact from this. When we get to May or June, whenever it's going to be, if that government money dries up, how many of those people will actually have a job to go back to? That's a good, uh, well, a worrying question. Um... So what would your, I mean, what would you be predicting from, from where we are here? Where do you think we're going? Um, in some ways, I think it's probably easier to talk about the next 10 years than the next 10 days, because things are just moving so fast at the moment. But I think, I think one, of the, um, one of the big challenges for investors is to try and think where we're heading in terms of the, the spectrum of inflation and deflation. If you, Imagine we're at the Highland game with a bunch of burly Scotsmen having a, a tug of war game and one team is dressed in red for inflation, one is dressed in black for deflation. And what are the forces that are going to pull that rope in either direction? So switching off the world's economy for three or four months, as we've done at the moment, very deflationary. Pouring trillions of pounds and dollars into the economy, very inflationary. But what else are we going to see? Maybe we're going to see a rise of economic nationalism and, uh, and a decline in globalization. You know, we've seen these threats to supply chains where they're spread across the world. We've seen hoarding of um, uh, medical materials and PPE and so on. And, you know, people diverting them to America from Germany or whatever. So broadly, anything that's to do with expanding the ease of trade and exchange would be growing the pie and could be inflation. Anything like trade wars, tariffs, nationalism is deflationary. So, you know, which way are we going in that spectrum is going to drive a lot of decisions. Now, it's quite interesting um, listening to Professor Russell Napier, somebody who's spoken at our events in the, in the past, and somebody I have enormous respect for. He was on a, a Money Week podcast recently, and he said, and he has been an arch deflationist. He's been talking about deflation for years. He said, I will never in my life have to write about deflation again because I think we're in for 30 or 40 years of inflation. And of course, governments are going to try and introduce inflation into the system as far as they can because that reduces the value of all this debt they're taking on. So they want inflation. Um, he's expecting that inflation to happen. So trying to pull all of that together into what, what I think is going to happen, my best guess 
would be a short-term deflation, you know, followed by a longer-term inflation. And if we look at what that means in the various asset classes, for stock markets, normally you'd expect inflation to be a good thing. It tends to drive those markets up. I suspect we're going to have to be a bit more selective in the next 10 years than we have been in the last 10 years. Really, I think you've got to try and look for the new fangs, the new Facebooks and Amazons and Netflix and so on. And I think they're likely to be in areas like uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, life extension technologies. When those things start to become mainstream, there's going to be some really big winners. And if you can get on board early enough, then I think you can see some huge uh, returns from those. I think one of the areas that's going to be highly risky is the bond market. It's already been in a, about a 40 year bull market. We've got these zero and even negative yielding government treasury bonds at the moment. Um, and certainly when, if we're entering a period of inflation, bonds, existing bonds become very unattractive because they give a fixed income every year. If the purchasing power of that income gets eroded by inflation, the value of that bond is, is worth less. So what you'll see is those bond prices going down and the yields going up. Remember, they're in inverse proportion. So as the bond yields going up means the prices have gone down. So I think bonds are looking very risky. It's certainly you know, people like Tim Price and Russell Napier have, have confirmed that. Um, property bonds, bonds are looking worrying. Stock market should do well because of inflation. What about my favorite, gold? I think gold becomes a no-brainer at a time like this, to be honest, Robert, because um, it is a store of value with a you know, proof of thousands of years of doing that. Um, I, a lot of people are kind of pro and anti-gold. Um, I think my point is it should be there as insurance in your portfolio, around about 10% of your portfolio, something like that. Interesting at the moment, a guy called Mike Maloney, who's a real gold bug, he, he owns enough gold to sink a battleship. Um, he's now buying silver because there's a thing called the gold-silver ratio, which is basically you know, how many ounces of silver do you need to buy an ounce of gold. That is at all-time low. So in other words, you need more silver than ever to buy an ounce of gold. So he's betting on that reverting to the mean, which means you know, silver going up substantially or, or gold crashing substantially, which seems less likely. So as a more speculative investment, people might want to look at a little bit of silver, but as Dominic Crisby keeps telling me, you know, silver rarely does what you expect it to do. So you know, gold, I would say, absolute no-brainer at the moment. Silver may be a speculative investment, but you know, who knows? The hardest, I think, one at the moment for me to predict is where property is going. I, I guess there'll be some degree of pent-up uh, demand from the, the lockdown. But equally, there'll be landlords that want to get out. There'll be people who can no longer afford their mortgage because they've lost their job. So if anything, I would expect property prices to decline in the short term, but then to start picking up in the medium term as, as inflation starts to take a bit of a hold. So it's a, it's a mixed bag across the different sectors. Um, diversification obviously remains very important, but I think... I think people will have to be a little bit more selective. I think, I think it's perhaps a, not such a good time for this passive investment across the whole index kind of approach. I think it may be a better time for stock pickers and, for example, looking at certain themes like value investing, where if you're buying good companies at reasonable prices, you're probably going to get a better return rather than you know, just focusing on a whole index. So I think it'll be a, it's going to be different to the last 10 years, and we've got to be ready for that. Okay, and what about um, sort of slightly left field things like, um, yeah, we've, we've talked about art before and, and also becoming global citizens. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we're, we're working very closely with our, our, our very high net worth clients at the moment, really on, on several levels, because you know, the, the two themes that I see as being dominant in the 2020s are higher taxes and higher inflation. Taxes will have to go up because governments have got to pay for all this debt they've accumulated. But for political reasons, I think that tax will be biased and skewed towards wealthier people. So I'm expecting new taxes of some kind on wealth, new taxes of some kind on property. Um, 
So knowing that's going to happen, the higher net worth clients are now looking at property and residency in some of Europe's tax havens. So we're helping them look at places like Monaco, Gibraltar, Montenegro, um, where you can you know, transform your circumstances through living in those lower tax regimes. But we're also helping them to look at what could be inflation-proof investments, and they include some of the things you mentioned. So fine art, uh, we're working with a, a, a lady called Meredith Bristol, who's a sort of top art consultant in that field. We're also working with Aidan Meller and his robotic uh, AI-driven artist, Ada, who's taken the art world by storm in the last 12 months. We're working with a, a guy called Ian Tyrrell, who's a classic car expert, helping people build their classic car portfolio. We're also looking at things like investment-grade wines and rare watches, but we're also accumulating a whole cohort of experts on things like tax planning, residency, inheritance tax, philanthropy, because you know, people need really good advice and really good structures. And yes, they do need to become global citizens if they're going to live and prosper in a world of higher taxes and higher inflation and also prepare the next generation for their inheritance. Because, you know, a lot of these people experience the old uh, clogs to clogs in three generations where one generation builds the wealth and then it very quickly gets destroyed. So for people who actually accumulated that wealth through business, and property and whatever, this is going to be a really crucial time to preserve it and put their, their children in a position to actually inherit and maintain that wealth over the longer term. So overall, would you say that you're optimistic or pessimistic about the post-COVID-19 world? Oh, I, I'm an optimist. I mean, I've always been a, a glass half full person. I just a little bit irritated at the moment. I think a lot of people, even you know, so-called experts, are, are hugely underestimating the impact of this pandemic. I, I think um, you know, it, it's so much wider and deeper than, than things we've seen before. It is completely unprecedented in my lifetime, and I'm you know, a lot older than most of the people watching this. Um, so nobody knows the honest answer. So, you know, we haven't a clue. We can only make educated guesses based on what our experience tells us. But there's some things that are already looking pretty clear. I was just reading an article at the weekend uh, about some people in, um, in Wuhan in China. Uh, there's a guy who owns restaurants there. Well, he's, the lockdown's ended. All his restaurants are open. Nobody's coming. Um, the factory owners are saying, a few months ago, we had orders and no workers. Now I've got workers and no orders. So, you know, it's not going to like instantly be a light switch. It gets turned back on and everything's back to where it was. There's going to be a gradual release of this lockdown. I saw a, a, a three-phased plan that started with schools and maybe a few shops. Then we went on to offices and then we went on to bars and restaurants and stuff. So this is, I think, gonna take months to unwind the lockdown. Who knows, how, how, how soon are you or I gonna be keen to be crammed into an aircraft like this with all that recirculating air for hours on end? I'm not sure that's something we're gonna to want to do. How no, soon or or we, cruise ships, yeah. Ah, oh, yeah, exactly. How soon before we book the next cruise liner, you know, or, or even going to a pub or a restaurant. So I think we will see some changes in our social behavior. That will have a knock-on effect. How many people want to commute on crowded tube trains? So will companies be forced to start having people work from home? And what are the implications of that? So I think, frankly, it will be at least a year before we understand the full economic and social impacts of this uh, and there will be winners and losers coming out the other end of that. Uh, and obviously for us as, as serious investors, we have to try and understand those trends and get on board with them early enough. And I, I speak to somebody who thought Bitcoin was in a bubble at $250. So, you know, we, 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 we could all uh, uh, make mistakes. But, um, you know, we've got to try and see where the next big things are coming from, get on board those trains from a growth perspective. But we've also, I think, got to really plan very carefully in terms of preserving existing wealth, seeing how we can um, position ourselves to perhaps avoid being in a higher tax regime, and also you know, how we position our asset portfolio to survive what could be a higher uh, uh, period of inflation than we've been used to in the last 10 years. Um, okay, well, yeah, as, uh, as I think I heard you say before, <laughs> living in interesting times. 
Well, unfortunately, that, that actually turns out to be an ancient Chinese curse. So it does look like they've rather over delivered on that one. So thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, on that note, um, Graham Rowan, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Robert.